Hello, everybody, and welcome to another day and another great webinar. Uh, today's a little different since we're live on a Thursday in the Americas, but that's because we have a guest that I'm really excited to introduce you to um, all the way from New Zealand. It's Friday over there right now, so TGIF to all our live New Zealand viewers. Um, but very quickly, uh, before I introduce them, I've got our usual reminders for live viewers. If you'd like to, you can escape full screen mode uh, in the webinar by going to the top and dropping down the view options. Uh, and when you have a question, make sure to click the Q&A button at the bottom. And actually, you can go ahead and open up the Q&A box right now so you can type your questions in as soon as you think of, of them. <clears throat> and I know you're going to want to have some questions today because we have a CAD manager with many years of experience that you can pick his brain today. Um, Michael Bain is here from Baffa Miskel Limited. They're a multidisciplinary design firm with many offices nationwide in New Zealand and Michael is the one making sure that they're using the best workflows for their high-profile clients. Uh, not too long ago he started bringing land effects into his company's standards I've been working with Michael through our technical support tickets, and I saw what he was doing to get everybody on board in his office with Land Effects uh, and getting them on board quickly. So I thought it was a really smart strategy that was really working for them. Uh, we often get users looking to do what he's done, so I thought, why not ask him? Uh, so you're in for a treat. So now I'm going to pass this mic across an ocean and over to Michael Bain. Great introduction. I hope I can deliver half of what you said. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I want to I wanna thank Land Effects for giving me the opportunity to tell our story. And um, that's exactly what it is. It's a story for the last uh, three years that we've been working with Land Effects. And so I wanted to take you on that journey um, now. So. On the screen is our, our journey this morning, um, what we're going to go through. So by way of introduction, I'll just take you through what we're going to go through. Uh, going to give you a bit of a background to Boffer Miskel and myself, just so you know where we're coming from. Whenever someone starts spouting wisdom, you've got to know where they're coming from to see if you're actually going to listen at all. Uh, so then we're going to take you where the journey started, how we first came across Land Effects and how we started implementing it in our company. I'll take you through some of our early outputs just to show you how we kind of grew into the product. We started just finding our way with it. Then um, I've got uh, the part where uh, after getting some outputs on the table, we decided, well, we better get some standards out. So people start, started reining in some of the creative um, outputs we were getting. So that was how we integrated it into our normal CAD standards. Then a bit of an analysis of, so is it really faster? Is land effects in our workflow, is it actually saving us time? Because people always want to know that when we're getting new software on board, is it going to save us time or is it just trendy? So I'll take you through some real figures in there. Then I'll drop in to do some live uh, demos of a couple of tools that we've found really useful in land effects, just um, for your information, you, you might already be using them, but just showing you how we came across them. And then right at the end, I'll just summarize um, with lessons learned uh, what are the kind of the summary of our journey and hopefully the lessons we've learned here you could start um, um, learning from those so you don't have to maybe go through the, the same thing you could maybe take a shortcut on your journey. Okay so without any further ado let's um, launch into the background of this whole thing. So I thought I'd um, show you where in the world we are if you're not from New Zealand and you're listening in. Um, this is where we are. This is a shot from Google Earth just to show you that where I'm currently speaking to you from Auckland, New Zealand, way down here, down under, as they say. So here's a Google Earth shot, street view shot of where I am. So I'm up on the third floor, sitting up there somewhere, transmitting out to you. And so, and of course, Amanda's given me a great introduction and she's way up here in San Luis Obispo. And here's her Google Earth shot, street view. There's their offices there if you've never been. Although Amanda immediately, when, she, when I showed her this picture I was gonna show, she said, well, we can do better than that. So. She gave me another bit more refined shot with a nice blue sky day in the Land Effects offices. So um, that's where they're coming from. So yeah, 10,500 kilometers apart and um, transmitting. It was just interesting when I was putting this together, I thought, I don't know, that's not often a view of our planet that you see, but that just shows you how big that Pacific Ocean is. But that's how far we're apart this morning. Um, but coming to your life. So a bit about myself. 
um, I started working life as a piping mechanical draftsman on a drawing board. Yes, that's how old I am. Um, we, I was taught how to draw, how to draft on a drawing board. And um, that, has, that has been the beginning of my journey. And it has actually, um, it's part of my journey, which I really value. Um, knowing how to lay out drawings when you only got one crack at it on a big piece of A1 or AO, um, that, that was, it's a good lesson to learn. And so then um, AutoCAD arrived. I was actually around um, when AutoCAD arrived in New Zealand. That was in the early 80s. Um, yes, that long ago. And I, I started using AutoCAD at version 2.1 after originally thinking I was going to be out of a job because I was a, a manual draftsman. I thought that's the end of me. But I soon learned, of course, that if you learned how to use AutoCAD, um, you were very, very valuable. So I used AutoCAD for 10 years and I basically stopped using it about release 14 when they used to call them releases. Uh, I started doing it by year. Um, so I swapped to MicroStation. Um, I was working in a company that uh, made the switch to MicroStation and I was using MicroStation for about 20 years um, in a couple of companies. I even started working um, as a MicroStation consultant in those 20 years. So I used it for that. Um, joined Boffa Miskel. They were using MicroStation at that time. And then in um, the end of, no end of 2015 in November, I uh, switch roles from being actually like a visualization specialist. I switched roles to being the full-time CAD manager at Boffermas School, and it's it's that where um, it's then when our journey started in, on the AutoCAD path, and that's not long after when, of course, Land Effects came into the mix. So that's a bit about me, a bit about um, Boffermas School as a company. Um, we are a 100% employee-owned environmental planning and design consultancy here in New Zealand. We've got, as we can see on the map now, we've got seven offices nationally spread throughout the company. We employ just over 220 people in the company across the, across the country. And we have, amongst that 220, we've got 70 um, landscape architects, which actually surprised me when I put the numbers together. I thought, gee, I didn't realize we had so many out of 220, having 70 of those as landscape architects. And I did a rough calculation having looked at that list. I reckon about 50 of those people actively use CAD. Um, you know, that's, that's getting into a CAD file at least once a day. Um, we haven't got many people who are using it, you know, 24 seven, you know, eight at, kind of eight hours a day, but those 50 would be in, in CAD most days. So that's the kind of the mix we've kind of got here. Um, we employ, uh, in our consultancy, we employ planners, we employ ecologists, we employ urban designers, landscape architects, GIS specialists, and visualization specialists. So we've got quite a mix. But as I said, um, 70 there are the landscape architects. Okay, so that's a bit about me and a bit about us as a company. Let's get into this. How did it, our uh, journey start? So it started back in um, 2016. We decided to, uh, tr to change from being a Bentley site, a microstation site, to being an Autodesk site. Uh, we decided to make that switch throughout the year 2016. We weren't going to just make a... a slam dunk kind of bang from now on we're using Autodesk products we knew that would be fraught so we decided that um, well I decided I suppose uh, that 2016 was going to be our transition year so throughout the year we transitioned from Bentley to Autodesk no new product projects were started um, with uh, any Bentley products any new project starting in 26 was to be started with Autodesk products and we basically weaned ourselves Self off it. And you might be wondering, well, why did we do that? Um, there, were, there was no real um, problem with MicroStation. MicroStation was, in fact, very well suited to our workflows, um, handling big data and handling mapping and aerials uh, uh, formed a lot of our kind of work and it was very well suited. But what we found were in, in New Zealand, it was very much a market driven decision that the majority of people in New Zealand in the community that we were working in. Um, microstation had almost disappeared. There were no major players left in New Zealand who were using microstation. And we were getting perceived by other consultants as being hard to work with. Um, you know, they use microstation. It was, and that was, we kind of heard that out on the street as it, as it was. Um, and that was not a perception that we wanted to have. So um, one of the, that was one of the main drivers was that we needed to be in the, the right place in terms of the software we were using, 
that we were using the software that everyone else was using. Another main driver too, of course, was the, the increase in BIM projects um, in New Zealand, that BIM was really taking off and was getting a, a large foothold in our projects. And the majority of these projects were being led by the um, architectural consultant on the project. And therefore the architects were writing the BIM execution plans. And so they were, they were dictating in there that the, the outputs for the project were, get, were expected to be delivered in Revit, which of course suited them. But that just meant that we had to be in that, in that world as well. So we had to have Revit on board and had to be delivering outputs in Revit. So that was another main driver of our change. So late in 2016, uh, in the transition year, of course now that having Autodesk on board, I was able to really um, leverage some of the uh, add-ons that um, I couldn't get to before with MicroStation and Land, Land Effects came on came up and there was another product which I've kind of, I'm very subtly not mentioning, it's Land something, maybe fill in the blanks, but there was two main players in the, in the mix that I wanted to look at and so I did some initial um, you know, free downloads and started testing it and um, Land, Land Effects started nudging ahead in terms of its ease of use. Um, the other product, Land something something, as we'll call it, um, that it had a lot to offer. It was a very broad product right across the landscape kind of genre. And it almost had, for me, it was almost had too much. And then also too, at the same time I was doing these testings, we employed a couple of landscape architects from the UK and they had used this other product in the UK and they kind of brought stories of, yes, it was, it was very good, had some complexities to it, but um, when it went wrong, if something went wrong, it went really wrong. And they found it was quite hard to work with. Had some really good, positives about it, but it was very hard to work with. And I was finding Land Effects the opposite to that. I was finding it very easy to work with. Um, the support was very good. The install was very good. And so I really started to lean with Land Effects. And then when I heard these personal stories, it kind of clinched the deal. So we went with Land Effects. And so the first Land Effects license arrived in April 2017. And then as, as I've got there in the bullet point, by November 2018, we had 10 licenses. So that was kind of our, our timeline. So let's have a look at how we actually rolled it out. Um, a big player in the rollout was, um, of course, training. And um, what I'll do here, I'll just flip to um, my live. Whoa, going live, it's always tricky. Um, the, this is my SharePoint. Uh, internal training site, which I use for all my um, CAD training. And so I, I have this, so at any time, any, any of our users can come in here and find the things that I've been using for training and I can point them to other areas. Like here I've got AutoCAD training via LinkedIn. We use LinkedIn Learning for some of our major courses if we have people who are really, really kind of beginning in CAD and we want them to do like a real kind of immersion course, we'll send them that way. Of course, I've got my own CAD standards up here. Um, that's the latest CAD standards. They can click on that and read that. Um, I keep a CAD blog where I'm just kind of constantly posting just little snippets of things I've found. There's a section on the site for tips and training where I often, I do a regular midweek session, a 20 minute, uh, minute session on Skype and um, invite everyone into look at it and I record it and then I post it up in here. Very much like what we're doing now with this webinar, um, recording movies and then posting them up. I have in-house training opportunities and of course there's one this morning, Land Effects webinar. Uh, then down in here, I've got other links to other LinkedIn learning. I've got links to our, some reference documents which are handy for them. And then down in here, this is where I kind of, this is where I kind of snuck um, Land Effects into our, into our sort of psyche. I, I posted these links to the Land Effects uh, website, which and these are some of the webinars that I had looked at when I was doing the trialing, and I found them very useful for getting into the product. So I just posted them here, and then when people kind of found the product and said, "Hey, I want to get to know how to use this," um, if I was, especially if they were a remote um, user, I was able to point them here, and they could click on these and go straight to the um, Land Effects webinars. So this was a um, a major player um, in the whole sort of selling, I suppose, of the product. So um, in terms of how it rolled out, six months in, we had two licenses and I'd done my first training movie. I had two or three users using it and I've, I, it was just gradually getting a hold. 18 months in, I, I upped it to 10 licenses. I, I'd already included um, land effects in our planting standards. I made a second movie and I got these 10 licenses across seven offices. I thought that was a, a good number to have. And I basically went up to 10, I jumped it up to 10 from two. 
in a, almost like a, a, a step of faith. I thought, here we are 18 months in and I've only got a few users. We've got to get better than this after using all my kind of training techniques of, you know, posting on a blog, putting, um, you know, little movies up on a, a website. I wasn't happy with the, the kind of the uptake of, our, of the product. So 24 months in, I went on a national training tour. I did a, a road trip. Well, you know, flew around the country. I went to all our seven offices and all up, I did uh, right and, you know, face-to-face -face training on land effects for over um, 50 of uh, of our staff, of our landscape architects. I managed to get around and see 50 of them over those seven offices. And during those training sessions, I was getting those classic, and I'm sure if you've ever done CAD training, you'll get this, that people having a face-to-face -face session were saying, what? How, how long have we had this? And, you know, I, it was very hard for me not to roll my eyes and say, well, actually, we've had it for two years, and it's been on our um, CAD website for two years, and I've made two movies, and I've done a, numerous blogs about it. Um, but there was still that kind of like, oh, my goodness, why didn't you tell us? And so there was a real uh, kind of confirmation for me that there is nothing. There is nothing that beats face-to-face -face for getting people on board. So um, that was a, a kind of a major point. And from that point on, people just started jumping on to Land Effects. The standards were in place. We're up and running. And now we have over 70 land effects projects and counting. So that's how I kind of rolled it out. It was a gradual process, but then it kind of really did a, a sharp curve when I actually got to do face-to-face. -face. So how do we actually set it up? Initially, I was very well behaved. Um, I kind of followed the instructions on the land effects um, website and um, I installed land effects on a centralized server on our network. And I had our users map the land effects folder on that server as a network drive. Um, we selected cloud data because it was recommended and I, and I definitely do recommend that. That is the way to go in terms of cloud data and in terms of the data that you're making planting lists on, bang up to the cloud, it's a no brainer, it gets backed up and it's there for all the users to get to from one spot. So I definitely recommend that. So that's how we kind of set it up. Um, IT stepped in and when they saw what we were doing and of course they always have opinions about how you're doing things. I mean, I'm the CAD manager, but I'm, I'm not, I don't kind of run the network. We've got IT people to do that. And so they said, well, it's great that you're using um, a centralized server and mapping a drive, but we've got a, a number of map drives already and we don't want any more, thank you very much. So they said, can you put your land effects folder on one of our other mapped drives? And we chose um, what we call our Y drive. Um, and that is a replicated drive. So Y drive sits on four servers. We have four major servers across the company where the red dots are. So these are our um, four major servers. And why we've done that is this was basically for local speed. We've, I mean, we've got good broadband, good um, fiber in New Zealand, but we, we people expect top speed. So we had these four servers, so everyone had their local speed, so they had a local server. But everyone, everyone, of course, wanted to have the same access to all the files all at the same time. And so this drive was replicated, this server is replicated around the country. It is done 24 seven, it is just replicating files. As they get updated, they get replicated. And of course, that comes with its own challenges, but it was perfect for our setup for Land Effects because I was able to put our Land Effects folders onto one um, server, which was the master, just happens to be in Wellington, in the middle of the country, and that got replicated around every weekend. It would get updated, so every server had the same files. But also, too, I've got the flexibility that if I had, if I made it an update to Land Effects, I actually took on board the the very latest update. I was able to push that file out um, manually to those four servers, and then everyone was operating on the same system. So that's how we kind of do it now. Our land effects is sitting on one server, but it's replicated around to four servers and that the whole company feeds off those four. Uh, in terms of preferences, of course, that starts coming into it. Um, when you start using land effects, I was just using it out of the box, but then I started, of course, tweaking it so it kind of looked, fitted into our standards a bit. But I, I do that kind of very simply. Again, the, the data is stored on the cloud, so that's easy. It's always accessible by everybody. But everyone's got the same data. I control our preferences. Very simple. That There's just a couple of deviations from kind of the standard sort of land effects delivery, but I control that. But also, too, all our users know that if we do have a project where there is a need to kind of deviate from our standard, there could be a, a certain client demand or a, a, a contractor demand, 
we can deviate. They just know they have to ring me and I step them through how um, they can make their own little preferences based on the our Bofomisca ones. They can make a little uh, kind of a substandard and they can have control of that and how they can write to that. And so that's easily done. So that's kind of how we um, handle our preferences. Uh, in terms of support, of course, rolling this out gradually, um, I am the, the national CAD manager, but I can't be everywhere at all times. So people do need support um, at other times where maybe I'm not accessible. So of course, I lean on that, that BML CAD site um, that I, I showed you. So that, that's kind of, I asked them to be, that's be their first port of call. Um, then of course, call me, of course, I'm just on the, a phone call away uh, and they can get questions asked then, but also I've taken them through and shown them the land effects support system where they can click, I've got it over here, how you can just click on support. And of course, I, I don't know if you've happened to use this, but man, I found that so refreshingly easy to click on support, it, it, zipped, your, it zipped your file up, put it on your desktop in a zip file, you got, it took you straight to the website to the, where the support tickets are, you fill in your ticket, linked the, the zip file to it and just sent it off. And really, really easy to use. And so I, I'm a big kind of I'm a fan of that. And so I definitely took our users through and said, that's how you, you're going to get a question. But of course, I did tell them, of course, of the time difference that you had to, had to drop them a line early in our day to catch them before they went home. But that, that's never been a problem. The response has always been really, really prompt. Um, and this is a note here. I don't know if you've come across it, but when I was putting this uh, presentation together, I saw this trainer thing here. I don't know, how long has that been there, Amanda? Uh, we actually just rolled that one out uh, at the beginning of the summer. That is part of our new, um, our new ribbons that came out with LandFX. Uh, okay. and, and also, I just kind of wanted to, to chime in on the support one. Um, also, to make sure, just for everybody watching, to, to let your team know to be um, specific about the problem. <laughs> I think that that's my uh, little point of advice, and we can definitely help even faster that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like when you when you're typing in the word in the the free text area of doing your um doing your, your what your problem is. It does give you little prompts that, that it tells you when you're getting better. When they, you've obviously put more words in, but of course sometimes yeah, more words can be more. So you yeah, keep... don't just lean on the keyboard, actually make them valid, <laughs> some valid <laughs> information. <laughs> yeah, don't tell you what you had to bring <laughs> things. Okay, well, can I just do a quick plug then? That trainer thing is really, really cool. So check it out. It's a, it's a way of kind of giving your users like a, a learning pathway and they can, they can get the satisfaction of you have learned that and they kind of can tick a box and things. It's really good. So yeah, that kind of surprised me. I thought, mm, maybe I haven't been checking out the Land Effects website enough, but Anyway, on one final thing here in terms of the support, in terms of updates, I just say yes. Um, never had a problem with it. And I'm, I mean, some people might say, well, we've had problems, but I, I've never had a problem with taking, when there's an update ready, I just say, yep, update it. And then again, um, I push that out to all, the, all our servers and everyone gets the same version and, and we just keep it rolling. And of course, it can be rolled back. If something did go wrong, which I've, we've never had, it, you can easily roll that update back. So it's not a big deal, but yeah, you know, updates, I just, I'm very simple, I just say yes. I mean, I'm pretty easy in that way. So anyway, that's that's kind of like, that's how we rolled it out, that's how we set it up. So let's keep going. Okay, so some outputs, of course, we started using this product and we started, that was a kind of like a mini journey in itself. How do we kind of get going on this? And so for me, the um, what it's all about uh, in terms of what Land Effects does for you um, is about annotating. It's how to annotate, and I kind of mean, I suppose, how you basically communicate your design. And so we dived in, and this is some of our early outputs. And of course, I work with very creative landscape architects, and they like their drawings to look nice too. They want that balance of information, and they want it to look good. So immediately we're diving in, and we're looking at, oh, should we, should we be using color as well as black? Do we do black and white, or do we just do color? Because there were some big fans of black and white, some people who were kind of, I don't know, I think they still thought that people sold black and white photocopiers or something, but they they were very much of this, This it always used to be anything in construction in New Zealand was always done in black and white because when you photocopied it, you, you know, colors didn't come through. And I kind of thought this was a bit of a new point, but anyway, so we had this kind of discussion. Um, do we use hatches against, um, you know, single planting? Uh, symbols, and we're just getting a handle on that. How do we do our leaders? But I, I mean, this was an early one, but the the the, the LA did really well, I think, because our CAD standards do say that if you are using multi leaders, can you please use 
only certain angles and make them consistent. So this person did very well. They got their leaders looking very nice. So that was good. We were starting to kind of get our head around um, how to annotate with land effects. But also too, and this is, here comes Michael, the old school draftsman coming out here. I, I'm very big on this. Um, I tell our um, LAs, I, I kind of get a little bit of free, free kind of rain here that I can kind of pass on some of my experience outside of the CAD realm. And one of the things, of course, on a drawing board, we never used to annotate twice. We would only annotate once. We wouldn't repeat things, but some of our young, young caddies, um, because they can, they do, and they do get copying. And so what I've, what I've got them doing is to be thinking, this is a, a planting plan for a um, retirement village. So what we've got down here in lot F are a number of units and each unit has got a garden outside it. And the garden is just repeated. You might go, oh, boy, that's pretty boring, but that's how they want it. And so you can see here, I've got the landscape architect to annotate it once and then just say, this is typical for all the units because I don't see the point. I know you can, I know it's quick, but if you copy it, it is more things to edit. And so I'm very much, as, as fancy as land effects is, um, we still have, we were still getting that balance of you can over annotate plans. If that, if that annotation was on every garden, it just becomes cluttered. And so very much um, we, we were trying to get that balance, even having a fancy tool that could do all this stuff so easily, you still had to kind of keep that sort of reasonable um, annotation level um, close to you. Like even in here, this was, this didn't rule out that the very cool tool of you can, of course, you can verify your labels, what was labeled. This still works because you can still see that, okay, I've labeled it once. So a whole lot of the gardens won't be labeled, but I know they are labeled once because I can see those labels. So it still worked perfectly with the land effects um, that utility. So I think it was kind of we're getting a good balance, but the journey wasn't over. We were still trying to figure out um, when, when are we going to be using hatches? When are we going to be using symbols? So we started kind of getting rules of thumb, at, like at a certain scale, you just use a hatch. And of course, these ones are all single species hatches. It was very good. But what do we do when we get mixes? Because sometimes to com communicate a mix to a, a landscape, or someone putting it in the ground, it was quite hard to get it exactly where, the, how the mix was actually positioned. And so we, again, we were kind of um, working through that with our contractors. And we had one instance where this one here, and you kind of go, whoa, um, this looked a lot simpler when we first did it. We had, all this mix through here was done with a hatch. And we kind of gave them an indicative swatch of this is what the mix would look like. And you kind of just roll that out across the area. But on this particular job, the client had gone with a very new a landscaping company and they were very inexperienced and they were really uncomfortable with this kind of um, here, this is what it roughly looks like, go for your life sort of instruction. Now, they came back and said, no, we would really like it to be, could you tell us where every, what every plant is going to go? So all this area through here, all this area through here, having been a hatch, we had to put it back into individual symbols. And yes, it took time, but again, um, land effects really helped out because of course you've got all the shotgun tools, you've got the painting tools, you've got the tools that you can put them in clumps and groups and fives and threes and sevens. And it, even that was a lot quicker than what we would have had. And so there we were, we've put all the plants in and man, that looks intense. But I suppose if you just take a breath and start looking at it and reading it, it is readable. And the, the contractor was a lot happier seeing exactly where each plant went. So that was kind of like, a, I suppose, our journey into our outputs and working through getting the balance right. But the um, land effects was a great support in terms of flexibility of having a number of ways of actually producing it. But of course, as soon as we start doing that, you, you get to a point where you need to rein it in. Some people were doing all sorts of um, wonderful looking plans. And so we needed to see that um, it had some kind of uniformity. So it was time to bring it into the standards. So this is what I did. Um, there's my CAD standards. And of course I included just like a chapter in there for planting plans. And so before getting that look um, locked in, I needed to put it past what we've got here at Boffin School is a group called Design Leaders. These are some of our senior landscape architects, um, uh, a representative from each office across the country. And they have kind of like an, an overarching um, call on on things like this, on and how we deliver our designs and, and all sorts of other things. So I needed to kind of show them um, yeah, what I thought and they, they could go and basically sign it off. So where I started with, I started with circles. Here was a planting plan that we had done um, with CAD and had done very manually. And I suppose as a draftsman, I see this and kind of go, Ugh. 
Um, and But this is kind of like an evolution, I suppose, of how drawings were annotated. And circles with a the business, they, they liked circles, and I, I kind of thought it was a bit of a leftover from manual days when you just had a circle template. No one would draw a whole bunch of symbols as a manual draft. I thought it was kind of leftover from that. And then, of course, now you've got circles, you have to tell them apart. Well, if you're doing black and white, you've got to get these zigzag things going on. And once you start zigzagging, of course, you don't want them to cross over, and it gets really complex. And you see here, to put these leaders in, um, with all the text on it, and we labelled every single set. There was no kind of um, shortcuts of this is typical or anything, and so we ended up with that. And so, of course, me being having worked in sales and marketing for a little bit, I, I know how to tell a story and get a point across. So I gave them probably the worst example I could find, what I thought was the worst example of clutter and unreadability. So I said, I kind of said, well, that's where we're starting, guys. So that's that's what we've got. That's our current status quo. So I said, but look. We've got land effects, look what we can do. And I thought this was gonna be, bam, this was gonna be the sales job, look at that. It's that same plan we just looked at, but done with land effects, with symbols, and with scheduling. And I said, how readable is that? And I, for m myself, and I even did it in black and white for them just to really make it a, a good sale. Um, but the design leaders looked at that and kind of went, mm, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that, that's nice. But we think graphically it's too cluttered. And I suppose this is what design leaders are for. They have an overarching call on what, how they want things to look. And that was their opinion. So they, they thought that was over cluttered. And I even said to them, but look, at a push of a button, you can make it coloured. And for me, again, this was all about readability. And I thought I was onto a winner. I said, look, with those two looks, with symbols, colored symbols, it's fantastic. It's a, a great look. But no, I wasn't, I wasn't selling them. They, they were still unconvinced. So we move up to, okay then, so circles. They said, bring back the circles. We want circles. So, and came the circles. So again, the push of a button, and we're into the circles. So if you, you've used Land Effects a bit, you'll know this. You can just push the presentation button, turn on outlines, and here come the plant outlines. And of course, if they are close together, they get clumped. And this is out of the box land effects that when you push that on, all the internal symbol gets turned into a nice thin gray and it gets a bit subdued. And I thought, well, there's a good compromise. That's surely got to be a winner. But no, again, they know their opinion and they thought, no, that still is a little bit cluttered, but we're getting there. So I said, okay, so um, let's have another try. And again, uh, another bit of land effectsing going on. I said, well, look, they have got alphanumeric circles. We can bring in a symbol that has the alphanumeric code in the middle of it. And so there we could bring circles, they could be clumped. You didn't have to use the zigzags because every little circle is identified by the code of the plant in the middle of it. I just put them on an angle just for some kind of, I don't know, some aesthetics. But, um, so this one here got the final sign off. Um, black and white, very simple, not cluttered, and, and it had a code so you could tell the circles apart. So that got signed off, so that became part of our standard. But the great thing for me was, in all of these, uh, in that sales job, in the kind of like working through what they wanted, I was able just to use land effects the whole way through. I was just clicking buttons and land effects. I wasn't making up my own symbols or doing thing any customized. I was just using land effects out of the box. So I basically used, I formed our CAD standards kind of from land the way land effects worked. I didn't do it the other way. I didn't get our CAD standards and try and push that onto land effects. I did it the other way. So it was easier for me, which is kind of, I suppose, a great way to do it. Um, but then I've got a little bit then box here that I've got to show you because only it was only weeks later after having that standard finally put on the standards, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do black and white. We're going to do circles clumped together with codes in the middle. We got some feedback from uh, a contractor who had got one of our drawings. And these were, this was another one of our early land effects ones when the standards hadn't kicked in by then. They were still kind of had free reign. So they were using circles, they were using zigzags, they were labeling it. And the contractor came back and said, we are really struggling on site to read this drawing. Great that you've got all the plants um, out and single, single kind of symbols, but we can't, we're finding it very hard to read. Can you color it? And so we, of course, I just gleefully said, of course we can. Um, and so I hit the color button uh, in Land Effects. And honestly, I had a set of about, I think about seven or eight planting plans. It took me about 10 minutes to go into each plan and have it colored, hit the color button and reprint the PDFs and send them out to site. And they were absolutely stoked. There it was, a lot more readable and just at the push of a button. So that was that was really cool. I kind of thought, now we've got a kind of a balance. We have got a standard, 
the way we want our planning plans to look, but if the client or the contractor is struggling, we can easily just switch up the way they're presented with very little work. I mean, the one thing I had to do was some of the symbols that we had allocated didn't have a color symbol selected. So I just had to go um, link those in a few minutes later and I had the colored plans. So that, that was a really good kind of exercise in getting our head around how to apply standards, but also having the flexibility that we can project by project, we can just flip it out. Okay, so uh, of course, um, part of getting some software uh, taking hold in the company is to prove that what we're doing now is quicker than what we were doing before. And so I had to do that. And so I, I did some analysis. I'm that kind of guy, CAD manager. I love doing, I love getting out um, a spreadsheet and figuring out a, all sorts of kind of sums. So let me tell you the before. So it's, it's got to be faster, right? I, I just had a feel this has got to be faster. And I know that when in the uh, in my journey of figuring out is land effects a good fit for us, I watched one of Amanda's webinars, and she won't be cringing right now, I hope. Um, and in her webinar, I think it was like the very first one of might have been transitioning to land effects, the kind of like the real if you're moving, this is how you do it sort of thing. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, and and she boldly claimed I don't know if it was boldly, she, she boldly claimed, look, you will be faster. I hope I got this right, Amanda. You will be faster from your very first project. I guarantee it. And I kind of went, yeah, I'm very cynical, of course, when it comes to software. And so she made that claim and I thought, hmm, let's see, eh? And so I did this analysis. Um, so here, here's my famous example again. I had to pick on this one. And please, if, if you're watching the person who did this drafting, look up, no offense at all. This, this was where we, where we had evolved to in terms of our annotation, the way we were doing it, this is where we'd got to. So no offense, I'm, you know. I'm not picking on you. Um, so these were the numbers. This was one of 11 planting plans. And I was able to dig into our um, digital timesheets and I was able to actually isolate the hours because it was kind of like a separate task. I was able to isolate how long it actually took to sheet up the planting plan. So we've got our, we've got our planting plan done on one kind of base file, right? Now I'm ignoring the hours to do the kind of design, the kind of like, mm, we, how shall I lay out the plants or what plants shall I use? I'm not, I'm not including those hours because I think that's going to be very similar to matter what software you use or if you use no software to do that. The kind of the designing, the sketching on, on kind of trace paper or butter paper as we call it, um, that sort of thing, that's going to be very similar no matter what you're using, but it is the annotating, it is the getting the CAD done, the sheeting up, the labeling, the, the scheduling, that's the thing we're comparing here. So I figured out by our digital timesheets that we had taken 30 hours to annotate the whole set. All 11 plans to annotate, to create them, to put them in sheets took us 30 hours. So in other words, putting all the, the CAD symbols in took us 30 hours. Um, of course, that included doing all these crazy zigzags and these crazy leaders that had to be stacked and kind of manipulated into, into the actual plant. So that took 30 hours all up. I also was able to pull out that it took 10 hours to schedule it because a, a different person had actually done the scheduling and it took them 10 hours. And so all up, 30 plus 10, 40 hours, we're looking at five working days, five normal working days to annotate and schedule the set. And so what I did for this sheet, I said, oh look, 11 plans, this was the most intense, this had the most plants on one sheet. So I said, look, I'm gonna estimate five hours to annotate this sheet just this one sheet. And I kind of looked at it as a cab manager, took a step back and said, if I, if I was presented that as a finished picture and, and someone said, how long would it take to CAD that, you know, put all that text and do all those letters. Five hours, you know, just over half a day, I'm thinking that's not bad, that's probably okay. So I was comfortable that five hours was a good estimate for how long that thing took to annotate. So here we go, after, ooh. So again, I did that file. I that's exactly what I, because I, I used that to present it to the design leader. So I thought, well, I might as well just do the test of how long that took me. So I just, I had four planting beds in this picture and I, I just labeled one as a kind of like a demo and it took me five minutes. To do those labels there, it took me five minutes. And it, if you've used Vandefix, you know that labeling is very fast. If you get your toggles, your, your ortho and your, your snaps toggling with your function keys, you can get all your little leaders lining up lovely. So, that took me five minutes. So look, I'm gonna say, look, okay, if I had to label all four planting beds, let's estimate that as 30. That's very conservative. 30 minutes to label all four. So I'm saying that's a 30 minute total for labeling. And I'm gonna say it took 10 minutes to schedule, because it did. The scheduling, of course, is a push of a button. I used very much a, a standard kind of table, 
I hit the button, it put it into the base file, and all I did in this file was basically create the viewports to chop up the schedule. Of course, this one here was just a schedule. I was just demonstrating how you can schedule just one planting bed. Up here, I scheduled all four planting beds, and simply in the, in the paper space here, I just made one, two, just to get the header in of the, um, see there, I've got the actual header in of the, from there, so that was actually a, a second viewport, and then a third viewport for the, the bottom half of the schedule. So I just chopped up the schedule into um, different viewports. So that was 10 minutes all up. So all up, 40 minutes to annotate. So if you're already starting to do the, the maths here, before I said the last sheet before Land Effects, it took five hours, and now it took 40 minutes. So I'm kind of giving the game away here. This is what it is, 40 minutes to annotate one sheet so I estimated, look, that's, if, that, if I can do that one in 40 minutes, I'm going to estimate the rest of them because they were a little bit smaller, less intense. I'm going to go with a conservative 35 minutes for the rest. And if you add that up, that gives you six and a half hours total. So let's go super conservative again. Let's call that a day. Let's call that one day to annotate and schedule all 11 sheets. And that used to take us five days. And so that's kind of like a, a bam. And can I point out at this point, that I am not being paid by Land Effects to tell you this. This is actually this is actually straight up and honest. This is a real comparison, real hours that went on the timesheet, and it's it's absolutely legit. I mean, I'm not I'm not telling telling no lies. So, and I um, I love my claims being challenged like that, and I I really appreciate you kind of pointing out the exact numbers that you encountered. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so full credit, Amanda. Yeah, you know, I mean. You, you said it was going to be faster, and it really, really was. And so it really is. If, if, I, if there was a really strong message about, you know, is it faster, it so is. Um, you will, it's, I've, I've told a lot of the people in, in this company that I've used CAD for a long, long time. I've seen lots of plugins, lots of add-ons, salespeople trying to sell you the latest software, and they all, of course, they always say it's faster and better and better. But there is always a learning curve. There's always a dip. There's always a downtime when people are getting used to it and you have to do this and do that. But this land effects is generally the first thing I've come across that really generally from the very first project with almost no training and no customization, you will be faster. There's no way you'll be slower. If you get, if you get your, your information you need, you'll be away laughing. Anyway, uh, it's time for some um, cool tools. How are we going for time? I'm doing all right, I think. Okay, um, better keep it going though. So P-Hatch, have you ever heard of it? Don't know if you have, but let's dive in to AutoCAD. So I'm just gonna show you, again, live project. Here we are in AutoCAD, no smoke and mirrors. This was um, a real project, simply just a bunch of planting down a median strip of a highway. We were just doing some, um, there was some veg there. They were gonna rip it out and put some new stuff in. I'm just gonna drop in here and, um, turn off my aerials because I know it kind of makes it hard. But the problem was, the problem was with this, we had a whole bunch, if I turn on the line weights here, we had a whole bunch of um, ground cover areas. These are the big green blobs. And then we just had some specimen trees and shrubs planted kind of throughout the ground cover. And so that's how it was done. So the landscape architect started doing this. And of course, we started placing our ground covers. And this was done just as per usual, just picking a shape and putting it in, and of course, part of the land effect settings is you can say for your ground covers to ignore shrubs to go around them. And look, it did absolutely superbly. But you'll see the problem, or I hope you can see the problem, is that when there is a plant or a shrub uh, or a tree which doesn't entirely fall inside the area you're hatching, like you can see these ones fall out, that the ground cover goes right through it. And of course, the landscape architect came back to me and said, oh, look, this is a bit of an issue. How are we going to get around this? Because they, they'd got used to doing things very quickly. And so when I saw that problem, I immediately went back. Here's another great plug. I immediately went, oh, my goodness. I was watching a power tip the other day um, where they talked about P-hatch. This is the perfect answer for this. So can I just flick across? I've just made a, a, another file. Oh, I'll just escape out of that. Uh, just go to this one. I've done a really simple file just to demonstrate this. Um, so th this, I'll, I'll dem again, I'll demonstrate the problem. So here we are, we're just gonna place our hatches and of course it does exactly what it should. It goes around it, but of course the ones on the edge, it doesn't go around. And I, I queried this right away actually when I first saw this tool with Land Effects and they kind of said it wasn't really a Land Effects issue, it was more like an AutoCAD issue, why this couldn't work. So anyway, let's, let's chuck in another, um, another 
ground cover over here, just to be a bit different. And there it was. So P hatch to the rescue, people. So it's just P hatch, just type it in. And bang, here we go. You have to select the hatch, you select the hatch, it gives you a brush. You have a brush, you've got keyboard commands, just like the shotgun tools for planting. These are the keyboard commands. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do this really quick, but these keyboard commands I'm gonna, I'm gonna use now. So you can choose different brushes. I'm just going with a circle one, that's all I wanna do. And so what it is, it gives you this brush. Now what it does, you can just click on the edge of your hatch and you can actually add to it. So I'm in add mode, and so I can just be adding it like this. If you wanna expand a piece of hatch, I didn't, but I'm just kind of showing you that. But just with a little toggle, I can toggle into subtract mode. That's a little tilde or whatever you call it. And so I just zoom into my plant that I wanna punch out. I use my keys to just drop it down and go bang. And look, there I am punching out the hatch around my tree. And of course, I'll reset that, get it going again, because I wanna work on this piece of hatch, this piece of hatch, of course, do my toggle to cut, zip it down to the bang, take it out, bang, take it out. And this one, of course, I wanna take it out as well. And that one, I wanna take it out, bang. I've done that really messy. I could have been a lot more kind of close than that. But there we are, there was the problem solved. P hatch, bang, bang, bang. You did all the placing of the hatch real quick as per normal, but just were able to punch out those ones that were the, the problem ones really quick. And I thought that was a great solution and it's a great plug for um, watching power tips because I would not have come across P hatch if I hadn't watched that power tip. Um, okay, so just as another thing though, Always, I love, I love people who use CAD who can kind of push the boundaries and they immediately thought, hey, there's a different way to do this because on our plan, we had quite a large number of these plants hanging over the planting areas. So they kind of felt that that, that technique there was quite manual and could be quite, take a long time. So what they did is they actually used boundaries. Um, so this is another little thing of just using the tools you have. So what they, it was a really clever solution they worked out. Well, I thought it was really clever. What they did was they said, okay, watch this. We're gonna get our presentation and we're gonna turn on our plant outlines. We're gonna turn them on. And so it does that. It turns on the outlines around the plants. Now I'm just gonna jump in here. Oh, can I get to that? Cool. I'm gonna turn off the shrub layers. Um, just to make life easy. I always try and make e life easy for AutoCAD because I don't know if you've used AutoCAD very long, but in the times that I've used it, I've found that actually it does struggle with kind of the whole flooding and making boundaries and things. So the, the, the more simple you can make it, the better it is. So boundary, let's go. Boundary, I'm just gonna use the pick points. I'm gonna create a polyline, bang, and I just go bang, and there is my, I'm just gonna turn on my line weight so you can kind of see that. So that's what I did there. Boundary again, yep, pick points. I'm gonna do this one over here, bang, bang, there it is. And so now when I'm gonna um, place my planting, I can just use it like normal. But of course, I am gonna to want to, to miss these holes. So I do have to use the multiple. Now what, what, this is tricky. I used to muck this up. When I hit M to go multiple, it takes you straight to a prompt, select out a boundary. So you do that, no, and then it goes interior. So I choose the interior one, interior one, Oh, and there it is, just live demos, don't you love it? I clicked away from it. Um, I'm gonna do the second one better, right? I'll do the second one better. It doesn't matter how many times you practice, right? Oh, so, I know, I know. <laughs> I know, and so get, there I go multiple. Let's slow down, Michael. So I go out of boundary, in a boundary, yes. And there it is, and I'll turn back on my planet lines, turn them off again now, thanks. I'll do that again. Plant, oh, sorry, am I in the middle of the card? I probably am. Okay, plant outlines, turn them off now, and they'll come back on. Lovely, lovely. I'll turn off my out shapes. And so you can see if I've done it correctly, right? If I've done it correctly, but that was a way of, there it is, the hatch has gone around those shapes. Just a different way to do it, maybe. Picking between those two techniques, I don't know. If it was a small little job, maybe punching the holes with pH was good. If I had a whole lot, maybe doing those boundaries. But a warning here, um, if you've used AutoCAD for a while, those creating boundaries doesn't always go well. So I, I kind of feel that that pH is a winner. It's manual, but it, it's very quick. But anyway, there, there we are. That's just a little dive into um, some of the cool things that you can do with um, Land Effects if you kind of just think creatively. Okay, so that was P hatch in a nutshell. Winding this up now, I know we're gonna get close for time here. Lessons learned. Lessons learned. What did we learn about our journey? Um, it is a journey. Um, don't think, I think, 
land effects is going to land and you're just going to go bang. One day you're not using it, the next day everyone's using it, everyone's got on it, it's perfect and away we go. No, I think you need to do it on a journey. So we, we took a journey, it was gradual. We did it with small steps. I basically got the software, got it on the system and put it out there just not like in stealth but just put it on my website, did a, a, a couple of movies and just got people using it and they just found their own way. Um, for me, this was a, a perfect approach because I had nothing to lose. Land Effects didn't um, make our AutoCAD files inoperable to people who didn't use Land Effects. Some software that when you go down a journey with the software, if you put elements using a certain software in an AutoCAD file, it would mean that that file was no good to someone who didn't have that software. But Land Effects is not that. Land Effects just uses AutoCAD hatches, AutoCAD blocks, AutoCAD multi-leaders. It's just AutoCAD stuff. And so if someone opened up a file that we had used Land Effects on, no big deal. Okay, they didn't have the Land Effects tools available to them, but the elements were completely usable. So it was no risk for me. Um, you customize as you go. This is another thing that um, Amanda brings out in one of her um, webinars, and it was probably the transitioning one again, um, that you can exactly do that. You can just use it out of the box. and Again, a, a big plug for, I think, look at Land Effects out of the box. It's got so many different solutions, so many different sets of symbols. Um, try and make that, that, make your standards look like Land Effects, not the other way around. But you can customize as you go if you need to. Um, it's fast. It is way faster than what we're doing. Um, if you do the mathematics, that was an 88% increase. Man, what, what manager is not going to sign that off? Um, it was way faster, and it, it's, it still proves it. Um, time after time. Um, multiple ways to give and get training. That's a lesson that I think I, I am never going to forget is that even though I posted movies, I did blogs, I did um, group emails, I, did, I, I talked to people, there is nothing like um, getting in front of people to get the message across. And this is, I think, a 21st century problem that people's bandwidth for, for message for um, getting training, for getting information is so wide now. There's so many different ways that they're almost spoiled for choice. And, but the, it's, you do not beat getting in front of them. If you can, face-to-face -face is the best way. Um, probably only just ahead of Land Effects webinars, of course. <laughs> I have to say that. Multiple ways to get, give and get training and also to plug the Land Effects website. There is so much good stuff on that. The power tips, the webinars, the, the knowledge base, it's all there. I've, I've found it really good too. Um, whenever possible, shape your planning standards around land effects. As I said before, it's so much easier. Let them do the work. I mean, why not? Let, let them do the things. And on that very vein, the last lesson I think I learned was, if you don't have what you need, if, they don't, if, there's, not, if there's something kind of you think, oh, if only they had this, ask them. It could be on their roadmap already. And they're really nice. And again, I'm not being paid to say this. I've, this is, I've genuinely found these guys are really responsive to user needs. I mean, we were in our first few months of using it and we said, actually, we don't think you've got enough greens in your, in your solid fills for, your, for your, your hatches. And they said, well, what greens do you want? And we sent them some and they just put them in it. It was just so easy. So that's it. There's my lessons learned. That's our journey. Job done. Awesome. Yeah. And um, thank you so much for saying that. That's really, really kind of you. Uh, we, we definitely try and, um, well, I mean, that's, that's how we've kind of grown this whole software, right? Is uh, you guys come with ideas. Um, we ask you some questions, try and figure out how to actually make it happen and, and make them into tools like, like the P-Hatch that you showed. That one's actually um, a newer tool. I think uh, in 2018, we in, uh, introduced that just to kind of solve problems like you were doing. And I was just going to say that we're totally with you on the multiple ways of training thing. I mean, that's why we've done the, the long webinar videos like this one, your short videos, because some people don't, they want to get their information in short stuff, written documentation, the, there's hover images on the ribbons now, the new ribbons uh, that you, were, you saw that those new help tools in. You can also hover over any of the tools and it'll pop out a, an image description of how to use it. Um, you can also hit F1 and it'll bring you straight to the help page. Uh, and now we also just kind of uh, are pushing out the, the new Land Effects app so that you, people can even get notifications on their phone um, when a new power tip comes out. Uh, so I'm not sure if you saw that one yet, Michael. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I saw it. I, I know you've got it. I, I actually, ha I have to be honest, I haven't downloaded that one. But, um, yeah. Okay, well, this is a reminder to go grab that one. Um, 
but I think we have, we had a few questions actually come in and we have a few minutes to uh, go over those. So if you're ready, Michael. All uh, way. Awesome. Okay. So um, one of the first questions uh, from Dana was, she was kind of, she was asking if you can make your CAD standards available. And I was saying, oh, that might be kind of proprietary. I don't know if you can even flash like a page of, you were showing the CAD standards on that training website. Um, All right. More oh, yeah. Can I yeah, keep talking? I'll, I'll try and I'll, I'll. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Cause she was, um, I was saying that, um, I've seen some users uh, kind of even sometimes uh, copy and paste our documentation pages from Land Effects on how to start a project, uh, how to use the tools, and edited our documentation pages uh, right. to kind of give more specific stuff like exactly how to name a new Land Effects project uh, and uh, number it and things like that, or using the National CAD standards and jumping off of that. But yeah, if you can yeah. kind of uh, so preview I'll, a few I'll, pages. Oh, just dive. So what I, what I do is I, I, I bring it or every six months or something, we get little tweaks. And so quite clumsily, but it's very effective. I just highlight in yellow what things changed. And so planting plans, there they were. Bing, they got changed. So here, I mean, I put it really simply because it wasn't hard. Um, so I, I really said that basically, look, planting plans are created using land FX. That's how you do it. Um, the, this is the set of symbols you use. Here's the alphanumeric set of planting. So these are the symbols that come with the little code in the middle. So I said, that's the ones you use. And I'm a little plug here, Amanda, wouldn't mind a few different symbols in this little set, to be fair. Just chuck that in there. That is on the list. Oh, and uh, yeah. as yeah. per usual, just uh, hit us up with exactly which ones you'd love to see there. Oh, sure. I do know for right now, um, I do know it's on our content list to at least get um, all of the simple ones in there okay. and maybe so even some of the other ones. Cool. So anyway, so what I tell them, of course, that's that's what your um your planning plan will look like on on the screen because that's how you'll do it. So that's great. You can actually tell them apart, you know, pretty darn easy. Then I say, look, hit the plant outline, bang, 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 there it is. And then I say, okay, here's the lay you need to turn off to get that get rid of the the inner stuff. Uh, and um yeah, and there's there it is, bang. So that's it. I basically did it in two pages. Oh no, sorry, I did it in three. Here we go. Because I said that's what it looks like labeled. Um and I said in terms of scheduling, I'm I said, look, rule of thumb. Um, I'm not going to put any, because I think it's so fast and so easy. I wasn't going to lock us into, we had to use seven columns. It had to be this way around. Every project is often different and every landscaper works differently. Clients want it done differently. So now nah, formatted for each project. I didn't, I didn't even put control on that. I just said, yeah, just do it. So, yeah. Cool. And, nice. and did you do that in like a uh, Word document or Google? yeah, um, the yep, th this is all done um, in in Word, and because it just makes it really easy for me to to edit, and mm -hmm. um, I just pump that out into a PDF. I put it up on our um, CAD training website, and yeah, they access it from there. Fantastic. Um, this one's from Jeremiah, actually. Uh, do you do you know the the technology that you guys use to replicate your servers? Oh, yeah, good one. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I can get it for you though, Jeremiah. But, um, because that, that's IT, man. I just don't dive into that. But yeah, um, yeah. Well, I, send I'm that sure over I'm... to me. <laughs> well, um, let's see. Um, Dee was asking about the alphanumerics, and I was just letting her know in case any, anybody else was curious about those. Those are actually uh, default uh, land effects symbols uh, when you go to choose a 2D symbol. Uh, you can find it up there and you can choose one of those alphanumerics. And if um, it, while you're waiting for us to fill in uh, those default symbols, you can actually save in um, some more variety of your own symbols too. Uh, it's actually really easy. Uh, we have a documentation page of how to go through that and just add a symbol into that folder and it will make it alphanumeric. Uh, so really your options are lim uh, unlimited uh, for that. And then, uh, kind of another question I see one being snuck in but uh, one from uh, Sonia was just um, asking about um, if she had a, a, a CAD plan that a planting plan that was already started in CAD uh, does she have to restart the whole thing to use land effects and I was mentioning that you can use uh, match plant properties actually to switch over all of the blocks 
into smart blocks. Uh, did you use that while you were kind of going through and testing out all the the styles, Michael, the match plant properties? Uh, yeah, from definitely. It was so, from that transitioning webinar yeah, that you've been say, mentioning. That's what I was going to say. Um, you need to watch that transitioning to land effects webinar because um, Amanda covered that exact scenario of having a completed plant plan, um, albeit that it's, it's used blocks. They have got blocks for symbols, but you can just swap them out. And it's, again, it's a really fast process and it's very kind of productive so it's it's a really um, that's a very good webinar to watch for that yeah and and you can start using the uh, as soon as you swap them over and uh you can start using things like highlight label schedule pretty instantly on that and mm. i also wanted to mention just for everybody uh that we will be posting this webinar uh later today on our website so you can catch what if you miss the beginning uh but also i'll try and make sure to uh have our website guys uh, make sure to link to that transitioning webinar since we mentioned it so much yeah yeah good idea yeah um oh yep that was the last question will the <laughs> presentation be on the website yep later today um it'll be there but uh i mean other than that uh i mean, as i said at the beginning michael you had such a strong plan to begin with, and I think you had a really effective rollout with the way that you did, and I really appreciate you um, taking that outline of your journey, those first examples, what you were able to do right off the bat before you'd even decided on your standards, uh, and then how you moved into deciding the standards and getting everybody on board afterwards. Um, I think that's really helpful for everybody watching, um, and thank you for going through all of that. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Well, have a great day, everybody. See you later.